Okay, good day, grade eight. Here's my face. Uh, it's been a while since I see you guys, so I hope you guys enjoyed your little bit of off time. And now we're back to work. Uh, I know this is a weird situation. Um, I know a lot of you aren't used to this type of teaching or online teaching at all, but let's try and make the best of our situation and let's just keep calm. Get into your routine, keep to your routine, and keep doing your work don't leave your work for the last minute all the teachers are busy with online classes this is the equivalent of you being at school so get into your morning routine same as i did this morning wake up take your shower drink your coffee get dressed don't stay in your pajamas all day and then log in see what work you have to do from my side you know now you have the settlements worksheet and the climates worksheet that you need to complete um, this slideshow will be us marking it and me explaining it as we continue. You will see that uh, we're going to start with the settlement worksheet. And then also remember, I submitted your task on Teams. It is there. I discussed it with you on the WhatsApp group as well. Uh, if you have any questions, send me a WhatsApp, send me a Teams message. Let's try and keep it between 8 and 6 on weekdays. Um, six at night now just so we can have uh, sort of have a structure to our day and still uh, you need some off time as well let's start with our first slide now worksheet three settlements this counts for the climate worksheet as well as uh, well if you did not hear the answer or you're struggling to keep up pause the video rewind and listen again this is the um, nice thing now for you guys is you can mark this on your own time you can re-watch this you can listen to it again this is now on youtube and it's yours to look at whenever you want to um, you are expected to show corrections when you return to school there will also be spot checks oh yeah no excuse the spelling mistake uh, spot checks done by me via whatsapp or team so how that's going to work is by the sixth you need to be completed with the worksheet after you're done with this, by the 14th, you need to be completed with the um, marking of the two worksheets. Once you're done marking the two worksheets by the 14th, on the 14th, I will send a random of you numbers, uh, messages, asking you to send me a picture of a specific question that you're going to need to reply to, showing me that you did it and that you um made your corrections there as well do not just go and copy the memo question one worksheet three settlements explain what is a settlement now we get two types of settlements we get rural settlements and urban settlements uh, pretoria east where we live or well where we live in pretoria is mostly an urban settlement. Those of you living closer to the Camillefontein area on the outskirts of the Pretoria, that's verging on rural settlement. The where I am now in Pongola, in KZN, this is a rural settlement. It's farms. Uh, rural settlements are classified by being, there's a lot of space between the houses where urban settlements is closer, compacted to each other. If we look at the CBD, the buildings are right on top of each other. And if we look at the suburbs, we can see suburbs and security estates. Most of you stay in the suburbs or security estates. They are spaced still close to each other compared to a rural area where you have massive hectares of farms um, with houses spread throughout the area. There are different ways to classify uh, settlements. Rural settlements are sparsely populated, so not a lot of people live there and mostly agricultural, like where I am now on a sugarcane farm. Uh, whereas urban settlements are densely populated and are mostly non-agricultural. So this is usually our service industry. We discussed this previously when we looked at trade and transport. We get our three main types of activities, our primary, our secondary and our tertiary. Primary being agriculture and mining, the getting the natural resources, the raw product. Secondary manufacturing taking this raw product and making something from it cutting down the tree making the table the last one is the service industry this is schools doctors shops 
So now I cut down the tree, I made the table, and now it's in the shop where I sell the table. Question two. There are two main types of settlements. We just discussed this, rural settlements and urban settlements. Then question three. Define the following. Definitely for Hunter. 3.1 land use zones. Allocated land with one specific use or function. So a land use zone for agriculture is an agricultural land use zone. In other words, there is just farming happening in that area. Then we get industrial land use zones where we find things like factories or mass marts where um, they are situated a bit outside of the suburban area so that they don't make too much noise. Um, light industries, 3.2 can be found in an industrial land use area. Land use, uh, light industry, small businesses where clothes or computer components get manufactured. For example, there's a lot more things that can get manufactured there, but it's not, they don't have massive refineries making things there. It's small scale factories. Then we get our heavy industries. These are the bigger business that manufacture things as cars or chemicals. Like example, um, the BMW plant that we find in Roslyn. That is a, a example of a heavy industry. Then we get the CBD, the Central Business District. This is the center of our city where all our high buildings are and they're close to each other. Why are the buildings so high in the CBD? Because property there, real estate, the area they build on is a lot more expensive. So they use a smaller area and go up. Whereas in heavy, uh, in industrial zones where we have light industries and heavy industries, Property, real estate value is cheap, so the area they build on is cheap, so they can go wider. So CBD, expensive, tall buildings. Heavy industries, light industries in our industrial land use zones, those are wider, flatter buildings because the area that they build on is cheaper. And then a residential area, a residential area is a land used in which housing predominates as opposed to industrial or commercial um, areas. Housing may vary significantly between um, residential areas, single family homes, multifamily residential, mobile homes, areas um, broken down into low, middle and high income, low meaning not a lot of money, middle sort of where uh, we are and then high income. Uh, let's look at Silver Lakes, for example, there or Wood Hill. Question three, define the following concepts. Continued 3.6. Uh, primary economic activities, raw materials, mining, secondary manufacturing, 3.8 tertiary sale of manufactured items or services. Um, we went through this already. Then 3.9 commercial farming. That is where we are now. I'll send a few pictures on our WhatsApp group as soon as I upload this to you guys to show what a uh, um, commercial farm looks like. This is larger scale farming where we produce more than what we need. We produce for other people. Subsistence farming is usually small scale farming where we try to support ourselves and our immediate family through either through selling the crops or using the crops ourselves. Question four, study the following two settlements and answer the questions that follow. A. Pretoria, B. Kalinan. Now describe the main activities of people in each of the following settlements. Pretoria is mostly manufacturing and services, secondary and tertiary industries, because we are not an agricultural area. Pretoria is a city, it's an urban area, where Kalinan is closer to a rural area, where we have farming surrounding Kalinan, mining and manufacturing. So we mostly have primary and secondary. We do have some tertiary. For instance, there is a dentist in uh, Kalinan. So in other words, there is some tertiary, but they're mainly primary and secondary. And in Pretoria, we can see that we're mostly um, secondary and tertiary. 4.2, identify the settlement that could clearly be classified as rural, that would be Kalinan. And 4.3, identify the settlement that could clearly be classified as urban, that would be Pretoria. Now let's take a look at this question. We can see... Um, question five, study the following diagram and answer the questions that follow. Uh, so we can, on this image, we get a settlement that is built to the sides of a road at a T-junction. 
we get a settlement that is built next to a road that is sort of an L shape next to the river and the plantation there. And then we get B, which is just a little, little house settlement there in the agricultural area to the side. So A would be a rural village. That's a small village close to the water at the T-junction. B will be an isolated farmstead. So that is over here. It's just a house and a store, for example, um, at the, in the farm. Then we get C, which is a linear rural village close to the river. Again, a bit of agriculture around it next to the road. And then we get D, which is something like a small town at a crossroads um, where people build that as easy access to the river and to other areas as well. And we can also see there's a track running past here and it looks like major roads coming into this T junction, splitting into different areas. So let's see first thing, explain how each settlement developed, A to D. D, major intersection on a level piece of ground close to the mountain and mines. Railroad is close to the town. C, it's close to the river, a major road and farmland. B, it's close to the river and farmland. And A is a major intersection close to the river and woodland. Now, if we look at this image here, what would this classify as? Would this classify as rural or urban? It will classify as rural. Why? Because we can see there's big pieces of land and the houses are few and far between. They're not densely packed next to each other. So we can see in this image that the houses are spread apart. It doesn't have a high population. The area that they live on is a big area. So 6.1, classify this area as urban or rural. Motorway to answer it's rural, mostly farmland with small town close to it, sparsely populated. 6.2, <coughs> explain why these farms will be classified as commercial farms. Large fields of crops placed in concentric rows, more yield than is needed for the town itself, signs of large scale agriculture. What does more yield mean? In other words, there is more produced than what the town itself can use. Question seven, explain the difference between nucleated settlements and dispersed settlements. You need to use a drawing to explain your answer. So nucleated, word that makes you think of, closely packed together. They're all living close to each other. Dispersed settlements, they're living dispersed, separate from each other, far away from each other, not on top of each other. If we look at this um, one here, we can see nucleated is densely populated. So that means all our houses are close to each other. Let's just use another color here. All our houses are close to each other. Then we get dispersed where all our houses are separate from each other. Populated spread over a bigger area. It's not as densely populated. Again, population density, the amount of people living per square kilometer. So the amount of people in this little square kilometer block here. The more people living there, the most likely it's nucleated. The less people living there, the most likely it's dispersed. And then just for interest sake, we get linear here. Yeah? Linear is usually caused by people building next to a road or a river. Um, usually that, de that determines the shape of the town. Question eight, make a list of all the functions in a city. So functions in a city, we get the CBD, we get industrial areas, residential, shopping centers, services, recreational um, examples of services is schools, hospitals, shops, banks. So you could either tell me the different areas in a city or the different services and examples of these services that we will find in a city, but we are less likely to find in residential, uh, in uh, rural areas. So for instance, uh, shopping centers. We won't find a big shopping center like Mainland Mall in Pongola, where I am now. We will find a small shopping center, which has a pick and pay and three other shops uh, surrounding that building. In Pretoria, the city, we will find bigger shopping centers like Menland, which has more shops than I know of. 
Question 9. Copy the following diagram and then identify the following land use zones in the city. So the diagram you received was just the outline where you had to complete it. Now, we talked about the CBD as high buildings because it's expensive to build there. It's the, they need a small piece of land, so they build up. Now, the closer we get to the outskirts of a city, the cheaper land becomes and the more flattened it becomes. So let's see, we have the CBD in the middle, which is our tall part. You can see that there. Then we get our heavy industries, usually close to the CBD, to deliver. This is not the only place where they're found. Heavy industries can also be found outside of residential areas. But for this specific image, Heavy industries are found next to the CBD because there's a lot of transport there. There's usually railway tracks. If we look at um, Pretoria and Joburg, there's a rail station close to the CBD. And then we get light industries moving further away because they don't have such bulk transport. Remember, we already did transport in trade. What do we transport with trains and trucks? Bulk transport. And then on the outskirts, we get our residential areas. Now, indicate where the following places will be found in a city. This is now our land use zone. So, A, B, C, and D. Let's take a quick look. Let's analyze each picture by themselves. If we look at A, we can see tall buildings. We can see they're close to each other. B, we can see bigger areas of land where people can live. And we can see high walls and big houses. This usually tells me this is a high income area. Then if we look at D, we get our smaller houses with a small fence on the outside. This is most likely our middle income. And then we get C, which is our <coughs> very small houses. We can't see fences around it and they're very close to each other. So this would usually be my low income housing. So. A is my CBD, my central business district, all buildings. B is my residential, my suburbs. D should be close to a heavy or light industrial area. And C on the outskirts of residential areas, informal settlement. So D, the small houses close to, if you look at uh, Vonnerboom Airport and Roslyn, the area surrounding Roslyn are smaller houses, smaller yards, not that high um, walls because they're close to a heavy or light industrial area. So it's mostly people that work in that area that stay in the Roslyn or close to the factories itself. Um, B will be our suburbs in the outskirts and C are informal settlements. Again, B can also be high income, D can be middle income and C can be low income. Question 11, identify the land use zone numbered A. That would be our CBD, our Central Business District. 1.2, Alexandra is an informal settlement. Explain what is meant by this. Uh, st Statistic South Africa state, the definition of an informal settlement is an unplanned settlement on land which has not been surveyed or proclaimed as residential, consisting mainly of informal dwellings, so, a definition of informal dwelling, a makeshift structure not approved by the local authority and not intended to be a permanent dwelling. So, most informal settlements start. How do a formal settlement start? They come with a plan where they're going to build the road. So, they lay out where the roads are going to come, where they're going to build, lay the sewage pipes under the ground, where the water pipes are going to go, and where the electrical cables are going to go. Then they put that out, then they build the houses. All these houses are signed off by the municipality and engineers saying, this is a house, you can stay there. This is a formal settlement. An informal settlement usually starts with a few, uh, how can I say, informal dwellings on it. No roads. The roads get formed afterwards because they leave space between the dwellings. That's why it's usually very narrow roads. Um, you'll see all the electrical cables running overhead. There's no underwater uh, underground pipes for water or sewage. So usually you have central water points where they can go get water. Or you would have a, um, a central point as well for the uh, toilets, for the bathroom facilities. If you look at 
uh, Kyle Leacher in Cape Town, um, they are very unfortunate to be using a bucket system. So they have toilets separate from their houses outside with a bucket that they basically do their business in and that gets taken to a central point and thrown away because they built there before there was roads, sewage, um, water and electricity laid out. Question 11.3. Identify two issues that people in Alexandra are facing. So your answers will differ to this. If you look at the image, um, no or sparsely situated primary services such as water, refuge removal, major roads, electricity and sewage systems. This is what we just talked about. The issues they're facing is there's no main roads there for easy access. It's hard to get in and out. There's no readily available water. They can't just walk into the house and open a tap and water comes out. There's um, no refuge removal. Like we put our bins outside of a house and someone comes to pick it up. Does not happen there. Um, the electricity, there is electricity, but most of it is illegal connections. It's a fire hazard. Um, it's a bunch of poles running over these informal dwellings. And there's no sewage system, so they have to make use of separate areas, allocated areas where they can use a bathroom. Uh, imagine being in your own house, there's no tap, there's no bathroom, um, the waste that you guys uh, take out of your kitchen trash can can't go to a truck, so it just heaps up or you have to take it somewhere. Uh, the road to your house is not hard, it's uh, just a dirt road that's not maintained and falling apart. Um, this is what we're talking about, a more informal settlement. Question 12, explain what is urbanization now. Urbanization refers to the population shifting from a rural area to a urban area. The gradual increase in um, the proportion of people living in urban areas and the ways in which each society adapts to this change. So if we look at this, we look at people moving from a rural area to a urban area. So they're moving from the rural towards the urban, making our urban population grow bigger and bigger and bigger. This is urbanization. People moving into urban areas. Uh, we'll get into more details when we get to push and pull factors. Now, calculate the percentage of urbanization in the following countries. So if you look at, uh, let's take the first one, for example, South Africa. We take our people in urban areas and we take our people in rural areas. We add them together to give us a total. Now, this is like calculating a test percentage. We need to know the percentage people living in urban areas. So we take our total, <coughs> we take what we got, which is our people living in urban areas. We divide it by our total and we times it by 100 to give our percentage. We take that percentage, we subtract it from 100, and that gives us what's left is the rural population. We do the same for England. We add everything together. Let me just clear this and then read it. We add for England, we add these two together to give us our total. We divide what we got in urban areas with our total. And then we multiply it with 100 to give us our percentage. And in this case, our urban is 94 and the rural is 6. And you can do the same for Botswana. What can we see here clearly? We can see that South Africa is more urban population than rural, um, a bit more than Botswana. In other words, uh, this is also a measurement of how economically developed the country is. I'm not saying we're more economically developed than Botswana. The Pula is stronger than the Rand, but our infrastructure and our urban areas are better. Where our economies are based on different things, which we'll talk about more in grade nine. England has a very high urban population and a very low rural population because they are first world country. Now, Question 14. Reasons for urbanization include a number of push and pull factors. So push factors, pushing people away from rural areas. Pull factors, 
pulling people towards urban areas. So pushing away from rural, pulling towards urban. So push factors for rural areas. Few services, lack of job opportunities, um, sometimes an unhappy, uh, unhappy wife, uh, life, your life, um, poor transport links, natural disasters, wars, shortage of food. This is now an all-encompassing thing. This is not necessarily every, each and every one of this will be there, but um, there's few services there because there's less people there, so the municipalities don't get enough money from that area necessarily to provide services. And if we look at our school, uh, we pay for our own refuse removal at the school. We don't have, like at uh, some of our houses, a person, a truck stopping there, they're taking your bin, they're leaving your bin, and they're going. Um, we have to sort our own refuse removal. And then pull factors towards um, urban areas or access to services, better job opportunities, more entertainment facilities, better transport links, improved living conditions, and hope for a better way of life, uh, family links. So they're hoping that if they move to urban areas where there's usually more hospitals, primary, secondary, and tertiary, tertiary education, in other words, universities, primary school, high school universities, um, medical care, more post offices, uh, running water, um, more services are provided in urban areas, as well as there's usually more and better job opportunities, more options. So that's why some people move to urban areas for their jobs. Okay, question 15. List a couple of issues uh, when too many people move to urban areas. So if there's too many people, now everyone's running away from the rural areas, they're now living in the urban area. But what happens? More and more people, we can't expand fast enough for all these people, so we get overpopulation. In other words, too many people staying in an area. We get less resources because there's more people using it. We're overwhelming infrastructure. In other words, more people are using the roads, the bridges, the everything that's already there, and it's causing congestion, for example, more traffic. Um, less jobs because there's more people coming in, more traffic, uh, they need to build more schools, the healthcare systems, the hospitals they have can't cater for the amount of people there, the public service demand arises, and there's more pollution. This all because there's more and more people moving into, um, moving into urban areas. And that's that for the worksheet on settlements. If there's any questions, feel free to ask me anything on Teams or on WhatsApp. Like I said, let's try and keep it between 8 in the mornings and 6 at night. Um, with regards to the task, anytime ask me a question. If you're struggling, send me a WhatsApp. Uh, if you still don't come right over WhatsApp, then I'll call you and we'll sort it out over a call. I'm going to continue in this um, session over into our climate worksheet um, if there's any issues any questions like i said just send me a message uh, i do try and apply as fast as possible um, try and do it to the best of your ability and remember to make corrections now let's move on to worksheet for climate okay so continuing with worksheet for climate sorry i just had to pause there to take a phone call now, question one. There are a variety of factors that influence temperature and rainfall. Name and explain five different factors. You need to use drawings to support your explanation at each factor. Now, I've done this and I've discussed this briefly before in class uh, during our revision. We need to look at our five different factors. First factor, distance from the equator. What is our equator? That's our zero degree line that runs horizontally over Earth. Second one, distance from the ocean. So how far am I from the ocean? Third one, ocean currents. Fourth one, altitude. Altitude, in other words, how high am I above sea level in meters? And then the fifth one is really if our mountains so let's get into this distance from the equator what can we see here 
we can see that they give us our temperatures here at the bottom. The darker colors is our warmer temperatures. So most of the areas close to the equator is our warmer areas. So we can say the further we move from the equator, the colder it gets. Why is that? So if the sun's rays hit the Earth's surface at the equator, it hits it at a almost right angle. So it's focusing that heat on a smaller area where if we go further away from the equator, it hits at, at a shallower angle. It spreads the heat over a bigger area. So it heats up slower. So it's colder. Distance from the ocean. If we're next to the ocean and it is a cold ocean current, we'll have Oh, sorry, distance from the ocean. I'm not ocean currents. If we're a distance from the ocean, different distance from the sea affects the temperature range at place at the place. The temperature range is the difference between the highest and the lowest temperature. Places near the coast have a smaller temperature range than places further from the coast. So why is that? If I am in Cape Town, wait, let's use if I'm in Durban. If I'm in Durban, my winters aren't that cold. Let's say it's 24 degrees and my summers get quite hot. It's 37 degrees average. Now that is my temperature range between these two, my minimum and my maximum temperature for the year. That is my temperature range. Now, why is that? Because there is a ocean there and water, which is a liquid, heats up slower than land, which is a solid. So if I take a balloon full of water and I put a candle under it, then it will heat up slowly. It won't burst because the water is taking up all that heat. If I put a balloon around a wooden block and I hold the wooden block over the candle, the balloon will mount because it gets warmer quicker. So the ocean regulates this temperature. It takes in the sun rays and it slowly releases the heat <coughs> Again, the further we move inland, the bigger our temperature range gets because we don't have an ocean regulating the temperature. So my colder temperatures, let's look at our school, for example. In winter, I, it sometimes went down to minus two degrees when I got there in the morning, where in summer it goes up. It's been 43 degrees when I left school. That's a massive temperature difference. Why? Because it is solid. It heats up quicker and it cools down quicker. <clears throat> Height above sea level. This just tells us that the higher we go, the colder it gets. Why? Because we're moving up high into the atmosphere. There's less atmosphere to take the heat in. So usually for every 100 meters, we have a normal lapse rate of 0 0,6 degrees Celsius. Ocean currents, if we have a warm ocean current like a Durban, we'll usually have warm, humid air blowing inland over the ocean, which means more rain, warm air, more plant growth. If we think about Kuzul Natal, we think about it looks very tropical there by Durban, uh, Sodwana. And if we look, move over to the Northern Cape where we have a cold ocean current, we have cold air, less rain, less plant growth. Uh, Northern Cape, mostly a semi-desert area. And then mountains, this is my favorite part. So this combines a few of them together. We get the air blowing to the windward side of the mountain, going up the mountain. This air cools down the higher it goes. It's being forced up this mountain by the winds blowing from the side. So this wind forces the wind up the mountain. As it cools down, it creates clouds and this clouds bring rain. That's why we have more plant growth. If we look at the other side of the mountain, now all the water has been taken out, out of the air because it already condensed and it already formed rain. Now this is the leeward side. Of the mountain. This is a lot drier area 
and less rainfall, also known as the rain shadow area. Question two, study the following figures and answer the questions that follow. We look here, we have a little map where it tells us where Port Nolith is, where Messina is, where Joburg is, Durban, Margate, Maseru, Fuchsburg, Kimberley, and Rhiannon. Look carefully at this map, look where the different places are, because you're going to need to remember this when we're marking the next questions. So, first question. Explain why the temperature at in Port Nolith will differ from the temperature of Durban, even though both of them are situated on sea level and at the same line of latitude. So, Port Nolith is next to a cold ocean current, the cold Benguela current, where Durban is next to the warmer Gullis current. So we can see that Port Nolith is a cold ocean current. What do we know about cold ocean currents? Cold, dry air. So, and the one we're going to do is Durban. Durban is next to the warm ocean current, which we know is warm, humid air. So the current affects the temperature because the water temperature is affected by the wind blowing over it. A cold current will lower the wind's temperature, a warm current will raise its temperature uh, as it blows inland. 2.2. Explain why temperatures in Margate will differ from temperatures of Fuchsburg, even though both of them are situated at the same line of latitude. So if you look at Margate, Margate is found next to the coast. Coastal climates have a smaller temperature range close to each other. The minimum doesn't go that low and the maximum doesn't go that high. Why? Because the water heats up slower than the land does. Uh, yes, the water heats up slower than the land does and it cools down slower than the land does. Whereas Fuchsburg is found in the interior where it will have a continental climate. So maritime climate close to the ocean, continental climate inland in the middle of the continent or close to the middle of the continent. Therefore, it will have a wider temperature range because land, the solid, cools down and heats up a lot quicker. Explain why temperatures in Johannesburg will differ from temperatures in Messina, even though both of them are situated at the same altitude. Johannesburg is further from the equator than Messina. Thus, the temperatures will be cooler at Johannesburg. Due to the shallow, so here's the Earth's surface, the shallow angle um, at which light, you're sorry, at which the light, uh, light's rays hit the Earth, um, this energy is spread over a wider area, so it takes a lot longer to get warm. So Messina, closer to the equator, Joburg, further from the equator. Explain why the temperatures in Masiru will differ from the temperatures of Kimberley, even though both of them are situated in the same line of latitude. Masiru is at a higher altitude than Kimberley. Places that are high above sea level tend to be colder. Remember, my normal lapse rate of every 100 meters is 0 0,6 degrees Celsius. Height above sea level is called altitude, so we can say that temperature decreases with altitude. 2.5. Provide the latitude and longitude locations of Van Rienen. Um, we've done this before briefly when I explained to you on the map in the back of class uh, how to determine this. So we need to know Van Rienen. What comes first? My latitude. L-A, latitude before longitude. L-O. L-A is first alphabetically. And this is my horizontal line. So Van Rienen here runs on the horizontal line here, which is 32, 32 degrees south. And my longitude, how long am I from my feet to my head? Vertical, so this line running up and down here, which is 20 degrees east. Define the following concepts. A physical map. A physical map often includes much of the same data found on a political map, but their primary purpose is to show landforms like deserts, mountains, plains, roads, buildings. 
a plateau, flat area, a fairly level area of land on the high ground, like we live in the high felt on the plateau of South Africa, a mountain range, a mountain range or a hill range is a series of mountains that connect with each other on the high ground. Coastal plains uh, is an area of flat, low-lying land adjacent to the sea or coast. So we get directly, we get the sea, we get the coastal plains, we get the next one, the escarpment, which is our mountain ranges, and then at the top we get our plateau. Uh, long uh, escarpment, a long steep slope, especially one at the edge of a plateau or uh, separating areas of land of different heights. Now draw a map of South Africa indicating the following features on the map, the plateau, here we can see the central plateau, we can see the mountain ranges including the Drakensberg mountain range, the Great Escarpment which is made up of the full Cape Fold mountain range, um, we can see the coastal plains here, in this area next to the coast, below the escarpment, will be our coastal plains. Our coastal plains here as well. And then our escarpment will be this ridge above. Calculate the daily mean temperature for the following places. So the first one, you take the minimum and the maximum. You add them together and you divide them by two. Remember to indicate your degrees Celsius as well. This is my average temperature per day, and that will give me a total average temperature, ooh, you know, sorry about that, of 26.25 degrees Celsius. Next one, 5.2, it will give us on the 22nd of the 1st, 32.5 degrees Celsius. Then it will give us 31 degrees Celsius, 0 0.5, 31, 32 degrees Celsius, sorry, 33 degrees Celsius, 32.5 degrees Celsius and 33.5 degrees Celsius, giving us a mean average of 32.3 degrees Celsius. Question 5.3, explain what factors of temperature will influence the places above. Now, in this case, it's height above sea level, how high it is. Distance from the ocean, one is close to the coast, one isn't, so one close to the coast, maritime climate, one further away from the coast is continental climate, and then distance from the equator. Pretoria, where we live, is far from the ocean, and then the equator uh, is uh, farther from the ocean, and then Maputo is closer to the ocean, but also closer to the equator. Pretoria is also a lot higher above sea level than Maputo. Uh, calculate the temperature range minimum and maximum for Pretoria and for Maputo. Pretoria 35 degrees maximum, minimum of 19, that will give us a difference of 16 degrees Celsius. And Maputo we have a 39 degrees maximum and a 26 degrees minimum, which will give us a 13 degrees difference. Question 6. Draw a bar graph and line graph of the following places on the same axis. Now, I know this question isn't very clearly stated. What it means uh, trying to say is what it's trying to say is a bar graph for the rainfall and a line graph for the temperature. In this case, they were combined. So, what we're supposed to have here is a line graph, a purple line here. That is our line graph, and then a bar graph for our a bar graph for our rainfall. Okay, let me just check it. Sorry, I didn't look at the index here at the bottom. Remember to always look at the index at the bottom. Um, our rainfall is the red lines and the purple, and our temperature is the green line and the blue staff graph. So what can we see here? We can see our temperature reaches its peak on the green line around these areas and its lowest point around this area, which is June, July. So what does it tell us? If June, July is where our temperature is at its lowest, that's our winter. And the places where it's at its highest, that's our summer. What can we also see from this map? Our highest rainfall is combined with our highest temperatures. Highest rainfall, highest temperatures. Lowest rainfall, 
lowest temperatures. So what can we say? In this area, June, July, when it's winter, we have less rainfall. In other words, in summer, we have our most rainfall. So this is a, of South Africa. So this tells us that this area is a summer rainfall area. In other words, it receives its rainfall in summer. Okay, let's continue to our next point. Question 6.1, calculate the average annual temperature. So you take all the temperatures, you add them together, and you divide them by the 12 months of which the temperatures were, and that will give you an answer of 23,08 degrees Celsius. 6.2, calculate the annual rainfall, add all the rainfall together, divide it by 12, and that will give you your answer of 1,150 millimeters of rainfall annually. Then 6.3, Oh, okay, let me just uh, clarify 6.2. It says calculate the annual rainfall, not the average rainfall. So the annual rainfall means you add everything together and that will give you the annual, the yearly rainfall for that area. So you just add all of them together and it gives you 1,150. 6.3, calculate the range in temperature as well as the range in rainfall. Temperature range, 9 degrees Celsius between max and minimum. Rainfall between max and minimum, 100 millimeters. Question 7. Explain the difference between weather and climate. Provide examples to support your answer. So, weather is our day-to-day -day state of the atmosphere. Today it is raining, tomorrow it is not. Short term. Uh, climate is our long-term weather so our average so we know our climate is we have this time of year at our school for example the climate is around 26 to 30 degrees celsius um, if we look at our rainfall our climate is that we get summer rainfall not winter rainfall so this is our longer often up to 30 years uh, trends within our weather systems question eight provide the elements of weather all four precipitation in other words rain wind temperature and humidity what uh, instruments are used to measure temperature wind speed and rainfall temperature is measured with a thermostat wind speed with a anemometer rainfall with a rain meter Then, identify the different climate regions we have in South Africa. Now, if we look at the map of South Africa, we can see this light green area here, including where we live. This is moderate areas. We have our yellow area, which is our desert areas. We have our dark green here at the bottom, which is our Mediterranean. And we get our light colors here, which is our semi-desert now moderate in other words it is moderate temperatures not too high not too cold and it rains semi-desert it's dry desert it's very dry and mediterranean it's warm and wet winters you understand why we say warm and wet winters um because we are moving into uh, matric work where we explain what is a barg wind and how do barg winds affect the Cape and why they get rainfall in the winter as opposed to the rest of the South Africa that usually only gets summer rainfall. Now, 11, provide two environmental issues regarding climate. There's a multitude of different ones you could have given here. Droughts, floods, Mass movements, in other words, things like soil creep or um, a mudslide, anything where a lot of soil moves, a rock fall, that is mass movements. El Nino and La Nina. El Nino, uh, lots of rain, La Nina, little to no rain. Um, these are all 
environmental events that can cause issues regarding climate. You can also say things like food security gets less because of a drought. Um, there's a lot of different answers. If you're uncertain about the answer, you're more than welcome to send me a message on Teams and say, question 11, climate worksheet, um, give me the question and then tell me the answers you've given. Then, number 12, explain the difference between a high pressure and a low pressure. A low pressure system has lower pressure at its center than the areas around it. So it makes what looks like a little bowl. There's almost nothing here. And the pressure is higher to the sides. As air rises, the water vapor within it condenses forming clouds and often precipitation too. So let's look at the basics of a low pressure system. Let's not get into too many details. Earth surface. At the earth surface, there's air. This air, because it's hot, what happens to hot air? It rises. As it rises and circulates, it takes the air away, leaving an area of nothingness, low pressure. It circulates clockwise as it goes upwards. Now, a high pressure is the exact opposite. This is air that gets colder and sinks down, rotating anti-clockwise onto the Earth's surface, pressing down, high pressure, pressing down on the Earth's surface. And then I think this is the last question, question 13. Uh, what is a land breeze and a sea breeze? Now, during the day, we get a sea breeze where the air on the surface, because it's a solid, heats up quicker, it rises. As it rises, it cools. It cools down and sinks. The air from this low pressure that gets left behind here, and this high pressure of the air sinking down here, air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. Why? If you think about a balloon, if you blow up a balloon, the pressure in the balloon is high, and the pressure outside is not. If you leave the balloon, the balloon will deflate. So air moves from the high pressure inside the balloon to the low pressure outside of the balloon. At night, a land breeze, it is the exact opposite of the during daytime, the sea breeze, where the air cools down quicker because it's a solid surface. As it cools down, it creates a high pressure here because the air is pressing down on it. The high pressure air moves over here to the low pressure where the air is warmed up by the ocean that cools down slower and then it moves over again and it circulates in this motion the whole time. That's the end. Good luck. Keep focus. Any questions, please ask me on Teams or WhatsApp. Remember for the final exam or for the exam, you must know the different climate regions of the world. That's on the map in your textbook, same as the map I used in the slideshow. You need to know how to interpret a climate graph. Take a look at that again in your textbook. I explained it already within the climate worksheet as well. If you're struggling, please ask. If the, for some reason this time gets extended further, closer to the exams, I will make more videos for you guys explaining more key concepts and revising previous work, as well as scheduling a live question and answer session for you guys, where you can ask me questions about the work. For now, stay safe, and I hope to see you all again soon.